Welcome to another Aston Originals podcast from Aston History. I am Brian Sutton, lecturer in history here at Aston University. Thursday, the 23rd of November, is History Day. And History Day is uh, a day when everyone can engage with the history around them, with perhaps the institution, the organization that they work for, and learn a little bit more uh, about the past of that institution, about the, about the history that, that surrounds them. But of course, history isn't isn't just about institutions or individuals. You know, history is, uh, as I say, it's all around us all the time. On Wednesday this week, uh, for example, the twenty second of November, um, it's that's quite a special day in history. It's the anniversary, the sixtieth anniversary of the assassination of JFK, President President Kennedy. Um, but it's also the sixtieth anniversary, but the same day of the deaths of Aldous Huxley, the great prophet of the Technological Society, and, uh, and C.S. Lewis also. Now, as important as I make history out to be here, history also seems to have something of a, of a problem. Um, governments call for students to be studying uh, mathematics, science, technology, etc. No government seems to want people to study history, or not very much um, at, uh, at least. History seems to be uh, a good hobby, therefore, and uh, perhaps not quite as serious as, uh, as other subjects. Um, and so what we have to ask ourselves was that was the great industrialist Henry Ford right to say, in fact, that history is bunkum? Well, we can't settle that question now, but uh, I think we can have a, a chat about the, uh, the history or the importance of history. Um, and uh, we've invited along some of our colleagues from across Aston University to talk about history and history in relation to their work and in, in relation to the, uh, the disciplines that are studied here. So, uh, first of all, let me introduce Mr. Paul Nobbs. Hi. Um, Paul is an international research manager in the Research Knowledge Exchange team. And so Paul is constantly talking to colleagues right across the university and all the different colleges uh, that we have. Uh, Paul, you're very, uh, you're very welcome. We also have uh, Dr. Dwayne Meller. Uh, Dwayne, welcome. Uh, he's a senior teaching fellow in Aston Medical School, uh, where he's also the lead for nutrition and evidence-based Medicine. Dean's also Associate Dean for Public Engagement in the College of Health and Life Sciences. Thanks very much for, for joining us, uh, Dwayne. I'm also joined, um, as, uh, as I often am, by Dr. Alaria Scalia, uh, Senior Lecturer in um, History, uh, in, uh, in, our, in our History section. Um, and um, uh, she'll be here to, to contribute as well, to give the, to give the history, uh, the history view uh, of, uh, of what we're talking about. So, Paul, let me let me come to you first of all. Paul, you you work right across the university. You talk to many many different uh, colleagues. Why why does history matter? Why does history matter mm -hmm. here, right right across the university? So, I, I think it'd probably be useful if I just gave a bit of an introduction to what I actually do, because sure. everybody knows what academics do. Uh, they teach and research, but they don't really know what um, a research administrator like me does. So. I work in the professional services at Aston, which is a dreadful title. Um, I uh, look after uh, academics who are submitting research proposals. So I work with academics across all the different colleges here at Aston, and I specifically support EU and international research. So my day is typically talking to academics about the proposals that they are developing. It's trying to find them to the right call and it's trying to sort of move them forwards in the development of their ideas, getting them onto paper, getting them submitted to a funder. So in terms of the bigger picture and the ecosystem, research in the UK is funded by the government, it's funded by Europe, and it's funded by varieties of different charities and trusts. So well, history matters in this context because um, we are all following the policy basically that this government um, instills upon us and I'm observing at the moment a really interesting period of history because uh, it seems that the effects of, sort of de-globalization are, are coming our way so 10 years ago Cameron government wanted us to get as close to China as possible and we were submitting lots of research proposals lots of Chinese friends so much activity with China you know we wanted to to make friends with Huawei, for example, and they buckets of cash. And now the sort of hokey cokey has adjusted and we've sort of, we're, we're 
there's a push towards perhaps nationalism and we are detaching from the rest of the world and we are pursuing our own independent research policies and it's coming down the line in many different guises so we are having to pursue lots of due diligence if we work with somebody from china we need to know if they're on the sanctions list we need to know if it's a reputational risk we need to know if it's a financial risk there are just impediments now to to how we work so you can see the sort of hokey cokey of history having a direct effect on our daily jobs as professionals and, and also on the academics that we have to work with because um, whether you like it or not we're going to push a load of forms our way because the government has cascaded this new um, direction down to universities universities have cascaded it to their research offices research offices cascade it to you so next time Dwayne you do a research proposal of China I'm going to pull out this form that you're going to absolutely hate. And you're going to have to send that to your Chinese partners and say, can you fill this in, please? Because we don't know whether we can trust you or not. Just the way that it is these days. OK, so um, what, you, what you seem to be saying then is that science and technology don't exist in some abstract reality up there that we can touch. In fact, they they belong in a, in, in a very, very human context. This human context is changing and shifting all the time. It's changing and shifting because of movements in, uh, perhaps in, in, in politics, perhaps in movements, uh, other movements in, uh, in world affairs. Um, and so there are consequences. Uh, we react or the government reacts, the country reacts, priorities change. Um, and I suppose the, the, uh, uh, the direction of travel changes as well. Yeah, definitely. And universities are, are interesting places because they do sit to some degree out, outside of this at the same time, outside of the sort of geopolitics, because we are um, international organizations. So I think to a degree, everybody's trying to resist this pull away from globalization. But it, but it's happening anyway. It's happening right? anyway. It's and, happening and, anyway. And, and yeah, yeah, and we're stuck with it. We're, we're watching it happen and uh, we're dealing with it. And who knows if another 10 years time the Okie Koki might go back out again and we live in a more global world mm. Mm. with um, no more forms for Dwayne to fill in. And I, I think I, what I like about your metaphor of, of the Hokey Koki is, is in fact the, 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 the course of history rarely just runs in one direction. It very often uh, tracks, tracks back, tracks forward. We have periods of, well, uh, the, the interwar period in Aria, which, which you're a specialist on, a period of great internationalization, mm -hmm. and then followed by a wave of quite savage uh, nationalism and, and, uh, uh, and so on. So um, the course of history doesn't run like a machine, uh, which is another reason why we need a, another sort of discipline to, to look at that, to look at that history. Dwayne, let me turn to you. Um, you are uh, um, uh, the lead for nutrition and evidence-based medicine. Uh, again, this is another area that a lot of people could think about just as a, uh, a very sort of scientific laboratory-based pursuit. But I mean, does it have the same sort of factors that we've been talking about with Paul, the human factors? I think there's a number of layers because if you look at nutrition and food choice, how we make our food choices based on our personal, our family and that cultural history we live in. You know, there's not one society on this planet which doesn't have historical either festivals. You know, you can look at the, the Last Supper by Da Vinci as an example of people sharing food being a cultural centre of our, 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 our existence. If we go across the evidence-based medicine idea, a lot of the principles of how do you gather information? Who wrote that information? How do you compare sources if it's information from the past, historical past? Mm -hmm. That is a methodology based on principles of history and studying history. Mm. If you look at some of the evidence, we look at dietary patterns, which is an area of interest of mine. You, that information is collected. You know, this paper last week that was looking at European diets, which was starting collected in the 1990s, and then putting a contemporary lens on that to see how it affects outcomes in terms of disease risk, something called ultra-processed foods. We need to remember that in 1990, our food supply is quite different to what it is today. And the, the levels of food processing has changed over that time. So we need to look at how our food system has changed. Okay, that's that's fascinating. So, you know, um, you in, in your position as a scientist actually, actually need to call on the kinds of skills that we're calling on as historians. We, we, I mean, we frequently hit gaps 
in the in 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 the sources, um, things that are just irrecoverable, you know, knowledge that's been lost. So you, you're saying this that actually also has to be integrated into a scientific view of food. And particularly something like nutrition, if you're asking someone to tell you what food they ate, there can be gaps in that knowledge, there can be incorrect information in that knowledge. Mm. And that's not because they're being dishonest or trying to hide anything, that's part of human nature. Mm. And the methodologies you use and the way you adapt and are aware of that and controlling for biases is very similar from a humanities like history to how you need to apply it in a, an applied science field in medicine and in particularly nutrition. Okay. Okay. So in, in point of fact then, I mean, history is just crucial for, for, <laughs> for what well, you do. Well, you could argue from a philosophical point of view, the mm -hmm. methodology in history underpins the methodology of mm -hmm. science. That's very interesting. I think, I mean, I, th I think that's also the case in in, in business mm -hmm. as well. Um, uh, yeah, the whole idea about case case studies uh, within uh, uh, within history, which was that was developed at Harvard at Harvard Business School, but that came directly out of out of uh, uh, out of the history study itself. Ilaria, let me let me come to you. So you are a historian, if you like. This is the other side of the coin. Now you're a historian who uh, connects with researchers. In other fields, you've done work on um, on the history of, of medicine, work on the history of technology, um, and uh, and indeed work on, on on history of the emotions as well. So, how does this problematic look like from the from the historian's perspective? Well, you know, the the first thought that comes to mind is that often that argument you expressed at the beginning. You know, we don't need the history; we really need the hard scientist. Never really comes from scientists usually comes from politicians who are trying to catch some quick line. My very exposure to science actually came from the scientists. I started, I started studying the history of emotions um, when I went to Berlin at the Max Planck Institute for a year. And that is an interdisciplinary institute with historians, clinical psychologists, uh, doctors of all different varieties, specialists, practitioners from all different fields. And it was a non-issue. Should the historians be here? Of course, the historians need to be here, just like every other discipline, because it was about that dialogue. And to give a very tangible example, emotions are not necessarily fixed in time, universal. You know, anger means something different for different people at different times. What does it mean to express anger? What does it mean to express anger in a physiological or in a pathological way? It changes over time and is understood differently. And these kind of arguments were accepted, were considered the postulate, the foundation of their work. So I think that's one, one point that comes to mind. The second one, I, when I published uh, my first book on uh, the history of international cooperation in the interwar period, uh, which, by the way, was a consequence of war, somebody thought that it would be really dangerous not to have the, co the uh, collaboration because that would have led to conflict. Uh, but when I, when I published that, I was really surprised by the attention it received from the scientific community it was reviewed on ISIS. I was invited to um, speak to the Royal College of Nursing at the medical school at the University of Birmingham. I teach a class here at Aston for the medical school. So what, what strikes me is really this gap between the public political conversation and instead the, the reality that uh, a university in research involves a 360 degree point of view and history is very much part of it perhaps sometimes more than other fields because it's everywhere because of its long standing in the discipline. But uh, yeah. Do you think that history, let me open up, you know, the question here. Do, do, does history have an image problem? Is it too much associated with, let's say, you know, kings, queens, royal lineages, castles, this sort of thing, mm -hmm. rather than with the kind of vital uh, questions that, you know, that all three of you have touched on? I think one of the challenges with history is also in the past. And we have this drive for the future, for technology, for advancement. And that retrospective look backwards to guide us, to steer us, can be forgotten. I think people still do it, but they don't do it in a mindful, thoughtful way. And we need to learn from what's happened and why we're here if we're going to move forward with any sort of reasonable foundation and sustainability. Mm. So I think it's not just the kings and queens bit and old ruined castles. It's a fact that we want to advance as a society, as people. 
and we need to just be probably repackage history as giving us solid foundation so we can move forward most effectively. Yeah. Um, it, it's interesting in, in business history in, in recent years, scholars have begun to talk about prospective history. So that's forward looking, his, not retrospective history, but prospective history. That's history looking forward. To what extent can strategic and tactical thinking be informed by insights from history? That, that At the moment, I'm, I'm working on a, a project with a colleague in the business school precisely about that. Can the current digital transition in industry benefit from looking backwards and, and uh, considering the lessons of the industrial tr transitions that we saw in the 18th century, the 19th century, the 20th century, which, um, of course, we're all ancient now. We don't think of the 20th century as behind us, but it is. <laughs> um, it, absolutely, it absolutely is. Um, so, um, so prospective history, I think, is is really what you're that you're, you're, you're alluding to there, isn't it? Um, what about what about at a national and an international level? Um, what about history at that level? So, I'm just thinking about research proposals because that's what I spend my day doing. So, when academics come to write research proposals, particularly in the engineering and physical sciences, they don't have to give much consideration for history. It's about developing new things. It's about the future. Um, they will often have to give some contextual information about the field that they're working in. And that quite often, um, particularly with physics, means they have to refer back to previous uh, things that have been achieved, such as Moore's law. Everybody's headbutting against Moore's law at the moment. And um, there's often a conversation, a contextual conversation about Moore's law and, um, and how that is to be overcome. And the, the physicists do a, a great job of that. And many of them um, have a sincere interest in history, uh, history of their, um, their, their disciplines and, and wider history. So Aston has an um, uh, Institute of Photonics. It's one of the sort of gold standard research uh, institutes. And they've got a museum of optical communications over there because anybody who does research on the current infrastructure in the road has to deal with legacy kits, decades and decades of legacy kits. So they are in a sense dealing with history in one form every time that they put a new innovation forwards, they've got to go and physically interact with this history of science and technology. Mm. And just one other thought. So you see a lot of research calls at the moment that focus on place. So we're being pushed by the government, as a consequence of the levelling up agenda, wherever that is at the moment, to consider place as part of the research agenda. And, and that means that you have to have a very careful think about the history of your region. So if you're preparing a proposal about Birmingham, a place-based project about Birmingham and the West Midlands, you have to have a, a very careful think about what where Birmingham came from, what the West Midlands is all about, and engage with that and engage with the, the past, with the history, and, um, and and explain how you are contributing and, and moving forwards on the basis of mm -hmm. what the West Midlands means and where the West Midlands has come from. Okay. Ilaria, what's your, what's your take on, on place? Place and emotion are so in, intimately place linked. Place and emotion and all of the, the different layers that, yeah. of course, history can unveil. But if I may go back to something that Paul just said that I think is really central to what we're talking about, I think one of the many reasons why history might not appear on many research applications is because when it's done well, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't make you want to fund that no questions asked. It doesn't make you think, you know, if you only, only follow me on this train of thought and you give me this funding, everything will be better. History can serve as a powerful opiate and soothe and make you feel like, you know, you come from this grand past but that's when it's not done well. As soon as there is a layer of depth there, really history serves that function. And instead, sometimes it's a cautionary tale. Sometimes it's a bit of a Cassandra. Sometimes, sometimes it kills that positive thrust that unfortunately has become a bit of a feature of our research environment that happens to be driven sometimes by research application money or political agendas that because of their nature, because they're read by many people, because they're very public, because they're supposed to enamor people, sometimes don't quite allow 
for room for what maybe we don't want to hear, which is that, you know, maybe money will not solve it all. Or maybe this particular research project might take care of this one aspect. But historically, like every other that has preceded it, every, every other innovation or technology is going to come along with another set of problems. Mm -hmm. And so the question is going to be to balance. Is this worth doing? Is it not? It's not an easy song to listen to at all times. Yeah, and um, uh, if I can just come back, your metaphor to Cassandra there, Cassandra, the, the prophetess <laughs> of Troy, who says Troy is going to fall, and nobody wants to listen. No. Um, and uh, I guess that that's another that's another danger, or that's another difficulty of history playing the role of uh, an instrument of foresight, because um, generally speaking, generally speaking, we don't like to hear <laughs> negative. <laughs> predictions about the future although they may actually be perhaps the best predictions that we that we have Dwayne can I can I come over to you just for any, any final remarks you want to make about this this whole problematic we've been talking about I think the, the, the problem is very clear and if you look at health inequalities which is something that here at Aston we're really working on mm -hmm. and colleagues in sociology are just published on in Birmingham we track back we had the black report in the 80s you track back to the 19th century in Birmingham, there were still problems with health inequalities. They've just manifested them in different ways in different communities. And really, we need to learn from that to find ways of going forward. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing we could, which we really need to acknowledge about food in this country, where would we be out with the history of food? The potato coming from South America. Is America producing things like vanilla and cocoa for chocolate? You know, you go to Marto's, also all these things from around the world all have a historic basis. So when we think of what is on our plate every time we eat, that's a history mm -hmm. of our country, good and bad, particularly if you look at things like sugar and how those plantations grew up in the Americas. It opens up your eyes to how important history is in shaping who we are today. So, in fact, um, history is not behind us at all. In a, in a sense, it's it's all around us. And you end up eating it as well. And you eat it too. Fantastic. Dwayne, Paul, Ilaria, thank you very much for, for, for joining us on this uh, on this podcast. Uh, so that's History Day on Thursday, 23rd, uh, 23rd of November this week. Um, have a look at the history around you. Have a think about the history on your plate uh, or indeed uh, wherever, wherever you want to look. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll see you again on uh, another podcast from uh, Aston History very soon.